Good morning. It's time for us to begin our Sunday morning worship. We're so glad that each and every one of you could be here this morning, especially to our visitors that are here. Uh, we, we ask you, you would please uh, stick around for a few minutes uh, after service so we can get a chance to shake your hand. We would also ask, if, please, if the, the pew that's in front of you, uh, if you would, please fill out a, a form there and just leave it on the bench or you can put it in the tray uh, as it comes around later on in service. Uh, we do have a few we need to remember in prayer. Let's continue to remember Lisa Robertson's mother, uh, Peggy Henderson. Uh, in your prayer, she is in the hospital with pneumonia. Also, let's continue to remember Jeff Seals' father, David Seals. In your prayer, he is scheduled for another heart cat on Thursday, the 28th at 1 p.m. Uh, let's continue to remember uh, a wiser Mitchell's mom, uh, Kendra Mitchell. Uh, in your prayer, she's having trouble with seizures. Uh, update on Loretha Wallace. Uh, she is awake. You know, she was in a coma, diabetic coma earlier in the week, so it's a blessing that she's awake now. But at this time, no visitors at this time. Uh, maybe in a couple of days, uh, they will allow visitors with her. She's in a married hospital right now in Jackson, uh, in room 2348. Former member Donna Taylor uh, has breast cancer and is scheduled for a surgery soon. So let's continue to remember her as well. Johnny Alwyn Sr. Uh, had some tests ran this, this yesterday. So let's keep, uh, let's keep him in our prayers uh, that he will have a good result from those, uh, those tests that he had ran. Uh, Bobby Lane's mother, Edith Kittrell, uh, is in UMC. Uh, she's having some stomach problems. So let's remember her, Edith, uh, in our prayers as well. Well, we will cover a few additional announcements uh, uh, at the conclusion of service. Uh, but open song this morning will be page 72, page 72. But before we begin, let's begin with a word of prayer. Our Father God, we are so thankful, Father, that once again you have blessed our lives, Father, to be here this Lord's Day, Father, that we can come and worship you, Father. Father, we give you all honor and praise, Father, as we worship you this day, Father. Father, it is our prayer that our service today will be acceptable and pleasing, Father, and always according to your holy will, Father. Thank you, Father, for our Savior, Jesus Christ, Father. No greater love, Father, have we ever had, Father, that he's shown himself, Father, to come to this earth, Father, to live a life as we have lived, Father. Yet, Father, he did it without sin, Father. Father, that he went to Calvary's cross, Father, that we all may live, Father. It brought death to him, Father, but it brought eternal life to us, Father, if we ever obedient to your will, Father. We thank you, Father, that he has all power, Father, through his death, burial, and resurrection, Father. And, Father, we know we can be heirs with you, Father, one day if we're ever obedient to your will, Father. Father, we continue to remember our sick that are among us today, Father. We ask, Father, we know that, Father, that you are the great physician, Father, and you are able, Father, to, to heal them of the things that they stand in need of, Father. So, Father, we ask you to hear our prayer, Father, to, to look to each and every one of their needs, Father, Deal with each one of them kindly, Father, the things that they stand in need of, Father. Father, we thank you for our ministers that we have here, Father. We thank you for Gary. We thank you for Derek and Ed as well, Father. Father, we thank you for the boldness they speak your word, Father. They, they speak on your word, Father, and only on your word, Father. Father, we pray that you will be with Gary, Father, as he come forward, Father, breaking unto us the word of life. We ask you, Father, continue to strengthen him, Father, in his, in his daily walk, Father. Continue to give him Life and strength, Father, to continue to do this ministry, Father. Father, we pray that whenever we fall short of your will, Father, as we turn to repentance, Father, that you forgive us of those things, Father, and remember no more, Father. And Father, once again, we thank you so much for the love of your Son and our Savior. And it's your name we do humbly pray. Amen. Good morning, church. We'll begin with number 72. We'll sing all three verses. 72. If you would, please stand. Come, let us all unite to sing.
Our next song this morning will be number 287, 257. We'll see the first, second, and last verse. I need the every
Good morning. The scripture reading this morning will come from 1 Corinthians chapter 14, starting with verse 13. Therefore, let him who speaks in a tongue pray that he may interpret. For if I pray in a tongue, my spirit prays, but my understanding is unfruitful. What is the conclusion then? I will pray with the spirit, and I will also pray with the understanding. I will sing with the spirit, and I will also sing with the understanding. Otherwise, if you bless with the spirit, how will he who occupies the place of the uninformed say amen at your giving thanks, since he does not understand what you say? For you indeed give thanks well, but the other is not edified. Would you pray with me? Dear Lord, we thank you for another beautiful Lord's Day that we can come and study from your word. Lord, we thank you for our staff here at Sywell Road. We thank you for Gary and for Derek and the great work that they do. And Lord, we thank you for the elders and the deacons that oversee the work of this congregation. Lord, we ask a blessing on all of those that are sick and cannot be with us. Lord, we pray that you be with them, be with their caretakers, that they may understand the issues and make the right decisions to return everyone to a normal state of health. Lord, we thank you for this country, for the chance we have to to worship in freedom. And Lord, we pray that you be with the elected officials of the country, that they may look to you for guidance and lead this nation in the way that you would have them to do. Lord, we thank you especially for your son Jesus, for his sacrifice, and it's through his name we pray. Amen. If you would like to mark in your hymn books, the song of invitation will be song number 10, one, zero. That'll be the song of invitation. Before our lesson this morning, if you'd like to turn to your songbook, song number 194, that will be our song before the lesson this morning, 194. We'll sing the first and last verse. If you would, please stand. We read of a place that's called joy to be here with all of you. We are blessed, as we often are, with some visitors. We're thankful for you being here as well, and we would urge you, if you, uh, if you would, stay just a few minutes following our dismissal prayer. We'd like to make you feel welcome. Hopefully, you'll want to come back and be with us again. If you ask a visitor to our worship gatherings, What is unique about the church that belongs to Jesus Christ? 
I think their first answer would be, you don't have any music. And that's exactly the way they say that, usually. Now, what they mean is, we don't have any mechanical instruments of music. Truth is, if you were to look it up, there are two kinds of music that uh, men use. One is instrumental, and one is voice only, or a cappella. Significantly, by the way, the word a cappella means in the chapel. Because originally, that's the way people sang in the chapel. That's how they sang when they approached God. The second thing, if they keep on visiting especially, second thing that they will note is, you all don't have any creed. And they might say, except the Bible. And that actually would be a true statement. And oddly enough, these two things intersect. And the lesson that we're going to present today is an intersection of those two lessons. The danger that we face today is that younger folks and newer converts do not know why we do not use instruments of music. They know we don't. They may very well love the singing, but they do not appreciate that this is really the way God wants it to be. So my goal today will be to help us to understand uh, instruments of music as they are discussed in the Word of God or as they are not discussed in the Word of God, as we'll see uh, as we go along. So first of all, let us notice that God commanded the use of instruments in the Old Testament. Look at the book of Numbers, for example. Numbers chapter 10. This, of course, is Moses. He's writing to the children of Israel. And we see what God says to him and what he has him tell them in chapter 10, verses 1 and 2. And the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Make two silver trumpets for yourself. You shall make them of hammered work. You shall use them for calling the congregation and for directing the movement of the camps. Now, it's interesting that the Apostle Paul picks up on that later on. And he's going to talk about how that an instrument of music has to give a certain sound, a clear sound. Why? Because they would use these trumpets to call them together for an assembly, they would use them to gather for battle and maybe even to charge into battle. They would also use them to pull back from the battle. If it gave an uncertain sound, imagine what would happen. You're supposed to charge, but some people here retreat. And what a confusion that would be. So Paul talks about that in 1 Corinthians chapters 12 through 14. We'll come back to 14 a little bit later, but we want to see that. Go on down in the same chapter, Numbers chapter 10, verse 10, where he says, Also, in the day of your gladness, in your appointed feasts, and at the beginning of your months, you shall blow the trumpets over your burnt offerings and over the sacrifices of your peace offerings. And they shall be a memorial for you before your God. I am the Lord your God. Please notice that God commanded the use of instruments of praise, instrumental music, in reference to the offering of sacrifices. There can be no denying that, and we should not deny that. In Psalm chapter uh, 81, verses 3 and 4 have this, Blow the trumpet at the time of the new moon, at the full moon, on your, our solemn feast day, for this is a statute for Israel, a law of the God of Jacob. Notice, blow the trumpet when? On your solemn feast day. That's in where they worship God. There were three times a year that all the males of the children of Israel were to gather together in Jerusalem. They were to praise God at that particular time. They were to worship Him. One of those times... Uh, interesting enough, is the time of the Passover, and they're commanded to use an instrument. 
And notice it's God that commands it. Very clear in this passage. Now look at 2 Chronicles. 2 Chronicles chapter 5. This is uh, drawing into the time when you're going to see the temple being constructed and actually being occupied. Solomon's temple is now ready. And as we get to that place, we'll look particularly beginning at verse 11. It came to pass when the priests came out of the most holy place, for all the priests who were present had sanctified themselves without keeping to their divisions. And the Levites, who were the singers, all those of Asaph and Heman and Jeduthun, with their sons and their brethren, stood at the east end of the altar, clothed in white linen, having cymbals, stringed instruments, and harps, and with them 120 priests sounding with the trumpet, or with trumpets. Indeed, it came to pass when the trumpeters and singers were as one to make one sound to be heard in praising and thanking the Lord. And when they lifted up their voice with the trumpets and the cymbals and instruments of music and praised the Lord, saying, For he is good, for the mercy, his mercy endures forever, that the house, the house of the Lord was filled with a cloud, so that the priests could not continue ministering because of the cloud, for the glory of the Lord filled the house of God. Now notice, they use instruments. How did God respond to it? He came down to be with them. He obviously was not dissatisfied. He was satisfied. And you can see that in his coming and filling that house. Go on down in the book of 2 Chronicles again. Now we're going to go to chapter uh, 29. And as we do that, we want to pick up at verse 25. This is when Hezekiah is restoring the temple. And this is what it says. And he stationed the Levites in the house of the Lord with cymbals, with stringed instruments, and with harps, according to the commandment of David, of Gad the king's seer, and of Nathan the prophet. For thus was the commandment of the Lord by his prophets. Notice, the commandment of the Lord. We're seeing it again and again. Now, could I pause and make an observation? The God of the Old Testament is a God of detail. If you read the book of Leviticus, and you particularly look at the construction of the tabernacle, you will observe that God was extremely detailed. Exodus and Leviticus, very detailed in reference to the building of the tabernacle. That God of detail specifies how he wants to be worshipped. It is seen over and over and over again. There are daily sacrifices. There are wave offerings that are offered. There are the annual sacrifices like the Day of Atonement. All those things are in the details. So God commanded in the Old Testament, under the law of Moses particularly, that instruments of music should be used. Go on down to verse 27 and pick up there. Then Hezekiah commanded them to offer the burnt offering on the altar. And when the burnt offering began, the song of the Lord also began with the trumpets and with the instruments of David, king of Israel. So all the assembly worshipped. The singers sang and the trumpeters sounded. All this continued until the burnt offering was finished. And when they finished offering, the king and all who were present with him bowed and worshipped. Instrumental music was commanded in the Old Testament. I don't believe we can deny that, not and be, not and be truthful with what we're looking at. Very important to see this. Now, Nehemiah, very quickly, and I say quickly because <clears throat> there are a lot of tough names in this section of Scripture. Uh, they may not be tough to you, and if not, I need to talk to you. You need to help me a little bit. But I want us to note, here is Nehemiah. They built the wall now. And they're basically celebrating the building of the wall and thanking God for what has taken place. So in Nehemiah, we find in chapter 12, uh, beginning at, at verse 31, that he talks about, uh, about these things. Now listen uh, to what he says. 
So I brought the leaders of Judah up on the wall, appointed two large thanksgiving choirs. One went to the right hand on the wall toward the refuse gate. And after them went Hosea and half the leaders of Judah, and Azariah, Ezra, Meshulam, Judah, Benjamin, Shemaiah, Jeremiah, and some of the priests' sons with trumpets. Zechariah, the son of Jonathan, the son of Shemaiah, the son of Madaniah, the son of Micaiah, the son of Zachar, the son of Asaph, and his brethren. Shem, uh, as we go on, notice what he says uh, regarding them and his brethren. Shemaiah, Azrael, Melali, excuse me, uh, is part of that. Geliah, Maiah, uh, Nathaniel, Judah, Hananiah, with the musical instruments of David, the man of God, Ezra the scribe, went before them. And so what happened? They have, they have two choirs with instruments. And this is Hezekiah following God's law precisely. I want us to understand that. That's the law of Moses as it was laid out. This God of detail in the Old Testament insisted upon worship with instruments of music. And we need to understand it. We need to identify it. Now, I'm going to do something that may seem inconsistent to you, but it's important that we next realize that Paul delivered God's commandment for all the churches. That's going to set me up for what I'm going to do next. That's why I'm going there. So let's watch him. In 1 Corinthians, Paul very often brings this up. 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 17. For this reason, I've sent Timothy to you, who is my beloved and faithful son in the Lord, who remind you of my ways in Christ as I teach everywhere in every church. So, you know, Paul wasn't a politician. Do you notice that? A politician goes and meets with old people, and what does he say? We're not going to end Social Security. The same politician goes and meets with young folks, and he says, we're going to get those old folks off of your back, and that's Social Security. Uh, they're just as inconsistent as they can be. But when you look at God, it's not that way. When you look at Paul as he speaks for God, it's not that way. What he says one place, he says in another. Look again. 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 17. But as God has distributed to each one, as the Lord has called each one, so let him walk. And so I ordain in all the churches. Look again, 1 Corinthians chapter 14, verse 33. For God is not the author of confusion, but of peace, as in all the churches of the saints. And then one more, 1 Corinthians chapter 16, uh, beginning at verse 1. Paul says, now concerning the collection for the saints, as I have given order unto the churches of Galatia, even so do ye. What's the point? The point is that when you look at the writings of Paul, that he delivered the same message to every church with which he dealt. And when he did so, he represented the same truth to all the people. Now, this next point, I've got to tell you, I would not have put in here. I did not put it in. I had a complete outline. I sent it to a fellow that, that I know and trust, and here's the response he gave me. Well, Gary, everything you said is true, and it's good. But he said, you need to understand something. Our young people are going to college, and they're being told by some people that nowhere in all of Scripture does God command us to sing in our assembling. I said, okay, i got to do a little homework. i got to see if I can establish that. Now, I'm going to, in the fourth point, I'm going to establish it the way I normally would have. But I want to make this third point because I think it's important for our young people. They need to be able to go and explain why they believe what they believe. They need to be able to defend their position for themselves. Brethren, it's time that we quit 
sending our children off to fight the world based on dad's faith. They got to have a faith of their own. They got to be able to answer the questions for themselves. And then they can stand firm and confident and not be shaken. So the third point that I want to make this morning is God expected singing to be a part of our assembly. The chapter that you heard read just a few moments ago, and I appreciate Jim. I actually gave him initially one verse, and he came to me and he said, that's not really the whole context. I said, I know. He said, maybe you're trying to avoid uh, what the whole context deals with and don't deal with that today. He didn't accuse me of not knowing how to deal with it. Just maybe you don't want to deal with that. And I said, no, actually, I'm going to deal with it. This chapter, 1 Corinthians chapter 14, is about the assembling of the church, but it's in the first century. And so it's very specifically about the assembling of the church and the use of miraculous gifts in that assembling. Now, in another lesson, if you like, I can demonstrate that the miraculous gifts have come to an end. There's no doubt about that. But the rules for our assembling, the overarching principles that we find in any assembling of the saints are going to be the same today as they were in the first century. And so let's see if we can get some overarching principles out of this chapter. 1 Corinthians chapter 14, verse 23, notice the first part of the verse. Therefore, if the whole church comes together in one place. Now, anybody that's been around me very long knows that when I get to 1 Corinthians chapter 11, and we're talking about the Lord's Supper, I notice there that five times in very few verses, the Apostle Paul uses the words, come together. And every time he is describing the assembling of the saints. So here's my question. Is this an assembling of the saints? And the obvious answer is yes, because he says you come together. So it's an assembling. Now, go to the passage that Jim read. I'm going to pick up with 14. I'm not afraid of 13, but I'm going to pick up with 14. And here's what it says. For if I pray in a tongue, my spirit prays, but my understanding is unfruitful. What's the problem? Well, imagine this morning that we had a visitor, and he was asked to lead the opening prayer. And imagine that that visitor is a native of, let's say, Mexico. And so when he gets up to lead the prayer, he prays in Spanish. I don't know about the rest of you, but I'm not going to be able to say amen, because All I know in Spanish is muy poquita, and that means very little. I can find out where the bathroom is. I did learn that one. But beyond that, I don't know Spanish. So if he prays in Spanish, he can be praying from the heart. He can be blessing God and asking God for true things from his heart. But I'm not going to be able to say amen. Because I don't understand. You follow what he's saying? Very important. Pick up on that. So he goes on from that in verse 15. What is the conclusion then? I will pray with the Spirit, and I will also pray with the understanding. I will sing with the Spirit, and I will also sing with the understanding. Otherwise, if you bless with the Spirit, how will he who occupies the place of the uninformed say amen? at your giving of thanks, since he does not understand what you say. For you indeed give thanks well, but the other is not edified. So now, think about our worship assembling. Two things that he singles out in our assembling. What are they? Prayer and song, singing. And in both cases, he he says... The prayers and the singing ought to be understandable, and they ought to be from the heart. That's the message. That is an overarching principle for our assemblies, 
and obviously they include both prayer and thanksgiving in song or, or singing. Look at verse 26, where he continues. How is it then, brethren, whenever you, look at it, come together, each of you has a psalm, has a teaching, has a tongue, has a revelation, has an interpretation, let all things be done for edification. Now, I'm well aware of the fact that several of the things that are listed there are miraculous gifts. I've already told you those don't exist anymore. They're done away with. They're not needed anymore. You know, I used to have a whole bunch of wood in my backyard. Wesley and James, I'm thankful you're done. No offense to anybody. I don't need that wood back there anymore. It's not there, is it? They cleaned it up when they left, and I thanked them very much. Thankful for the new fence, even though I had to borrow money to pay for it. <laughs> uh, I'm thankful for the work that they did, but I don't want the, the parts anymore. I don't need them. Well, the church doesn't need the miraculous gifts anymore. Why not? Because the parts have done their job. That's why. Because we now know what the will of the Lord is. It's been revealed to us. We don't need the miraculous gifts. But in our assembling, everything ought to be done for what purpose? Edification. The word is oikidoma. It means build up. Everything we do ought to build up the other saints. And a part of that is what? A song. That's one part of it. It's not all of it, but it is one part of it. So we've seen that the Apostle Paul delivered God's truth, God's will, for all the churches. And as he did so, he indicated that God expects singing to be part of our assembling. Next, and most importantly, notice, God commanded that we use our voices from the heart. Listen to him. We're going to first see that he's writing to the church. Ephesians chapter 1, verse 1. Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ by the will of God, to the saints who are in Ephesus and faithful in Christ Jesus. Okay, to whom is the letter written? It's written to the saints. Now, as a side note, brethren, you don't have to die physically to become a saint. I know there are churches that believe that, but it's not true. Paul's writing to living people. They're part of the church. What are they called? They're called saints. You could use a different word, maybe make it easier. They're the sanctified. And that's what we all are if we're part of the body of Christ. We're the sanctified. So he's writing to the sanctified at Thessalonica. What does he tell them? In Ephesians chapter 5, verse 19, among other things, he says, speaking to one another in psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your hearts to the Lord. Now, is this about a worship gathering? Or is it just about whenever you sing? The answer is evident within the text. Speaking to one another. If I'm singing all by myself in the car, and some of you might say, you know, that might be a good thing for you to do, brother, instead of singing while we're all together. You don't have a very good voice. Well, okay, whatever. But, but if I'm singing in the car by myself, am I singing to one another? Well, no, of course not. But if we're in the assembling, am I singing to you and you're singing to me? Yes, we are. When we do so, we do so how? Now notice he says, making melody in your heart. The word making melody is, could literally be translated, you're plucking the strings as it were. But the thing is, it doesn't tell pluck what. You know, if I said everybody bring something to pluck uh, tonight, well, one fellow might bring a chicken because he's hungry. And he's going to pluck the chicken. Now somebody else might bring a banjo because he knows how to play the banjo. He's going to bring that. Somebody else a guitar. Somebody else might bring a number of other possible things. See, pluck. 
why, why one woman, uh, if Morgan's particularly upset with Drew, she might pluck his beard. I don't know. That's a possibility, you know. That's, that's, that would be allowable, except for one thing. There's no instrument inherent in that word, is there? Pluck. Well, pluck what, Gary? Pluck what, Paul? He tells us, making melody in your heart. When we sing, we sing from the heart. Now, brethren, we're talking today about instrumental music preeminently. But I want us to think about something. Can a Christian sit in the assembling of the saints on normal days? I'm not saying you lost your voice or whatever because you got laryngitis. I'm not talking about that. But on a normal day, can the average Christian sit in the assembling and not sing? The answer is no. Singing is a part of our assembling. Now, I've already told you, I may not have the best voice, but I'm going to sing. Because you know what? I'm not trying to please you. I'm trying to please God. Now, I'll do the best I can, and I try to grow in my singing, but I'm going to try to please God. What about you? I think that's the way it ought to be. Don't you? All right, so Paul told the Ephesian Christians what? That they ought to pluck their heartstrings while they sing. Now notice, in the book of Colossians, first of all, who's Paul writing to? And the answer is, Colossians chapter 1, verses 1 and 2, Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ by the will of God, and Timothy, our brother, to the saints and faithful brethren in Christ who are in Colossae. This is to the church, right? It's to the saints. Again, same thing we saw in the Ephesian epistle. Now, I would make an interesting observation. If you read all the way to chapter 4 of Colossians, all the way to the end, you know what you're going to discover? Paul says, this letter, letter ought to be read not just at Colossae, it ought to be read at Laodicea. So is this a letter for all the churches? In a sense of the word, the answer is yes. Is it therefore a letter for us? The answer would be yes, it is for us. Because whatever Paul taught in one church, he taught in all the churches. And it was always what? The will of God. And so we need to remember that as we look at these passages. Colossians 3.16 particularly is a part of what we're talking about today. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. Now, I would first observe that just like the one in Ephesians, that he says one another, doesn't he? I'm singing to you, you're singing to me. We're all being built up by what we're singing. But then furthermore, he says, this time with grace in your hearts to the Lord. Instead of saying, plucking the heartstrings, he says, basically, with thanksgiving in your heart to the Lord. What have we learned? There's a reason we don't use instruments of music in our assembly. And the reason is because a God of detail, and if you deny that, you're basically saying the Old Testament's not real. It's not the Word of God. God is a God of detail. Does He express what He wants when He wants it? And the answer to that is yes, undeniably. It's always yes. The God of detail in the Old Testament asked that instruments of music be made and be used in praise. But in the New Testament, that God of detail turned from an, in, an outward showing service to a very much inward showing service. And as he did so, he expressed it this way. I want the instrument I made to praise me. And that is the human heart. That's why we don't use instruments of music. Now, you may be thinking, yeah, but my friends say everybody else does it. Well, they don't know their history very well. The first time, and listen to me carefully, the first time 
that instruments of music were used in a worship gathering was in 670 A.D. For over 600 years, the church exclusively sang with the voice. That's why a cappella in the chapel. That's where the word came from. That's where the idea came from. But in 670, it was done by a pope named Vitalianus. And as soon as Vitalianus died, they took the organ back out. When did the Catholic Church first begin to broadly use instruments of music? In the 1200s. In the 1200s. Now, there were certain fellows that didn't approve of what the Catholic Church had done. They were members of that church. Let me quickly say that. Among them were men like Luther and Calvin. I want to read one quote from John Calvin. Calvin lived in the 1500s. Listen to what he had to say. But when they frequent their sacred assemblies, musical instruments in celebrating the praises of God would be no more suitable than the burning of incense, the lighting up of lamps, and the restoration of the other shadows of the law. You see what Calvin just said? He said, well, we learn today. He said, yes, they used instruments under the law of Moses, but we don't use them today. Why not? Because the God of detail did not ask for them. That's why. Instead, we offer the wonderful music of praise with our voices being blended together with our hearts. Now, all that we try to do by looking at Scripture, except for a few historical ideas. Truth is, everything we do ought to be by Scripture, because God is a God of detail. So if a Christian is sitting here today and realizes that he or she has stumbled back into sin, what should they do? The God of detail has told us. 1 John 1, verse 9, If we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. But what about if you're in this audience today and you've never obeyed the gospel? Then that means... With no offense intended, that means you're still in sin. And the ultimate result, the consequence of that sin, will be your spiritual eternal death. That's what Paul says in Romans chapter 6, verse 23. What are you going to do about it? Well, that's interesting because the people on Pentecost asked that very question. Men and brethren, what shall we do? That's Acts 2, verse 37. And the answer comes back from Peter when he says, repent. And let every one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of your sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. We're trying to follow one creed, God's creed, the book of belief that he wrote for us, the Bible. If you're ready to join us in that, or if you've already joined and you're struggling, now's the time. Come while we sing.
You'll see the first and last verse. Father, we want to thank you for this opportunity we have to gather around this table and to remember the sacrifice that Jesus made. Help us to clear our minds so we can focus on Jesus and all that he did for us. We ask that you bless this bread as we partake of it. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.
Dear Heavenly Father, as we continue this memorial, um, we once again want to thank you for Jesus. Thank you for giving him the strength to go through that suffering that he went through so that we may have forgiveness for our sins. Uh, thank you for that blood he shed, and please bless this cup that represents that blood, and I pray that we take it in a manner well-pleasing to you. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. All right, let's have a prayer for the offering. Dear Heavenly Father, we do thank you for Jesus and all the spiritual blessings you bestowed upon us. We also want to thank you for meeting our daily needs and for our jobs and the ways we have for providing for our family. As we give back at this time, help us to do so with cheerful hearts, and we ask that you bless this offering, that it may be best used to spread your word, and uh, in Christ's name we pray, amen. We do have a few additional announcements before we uh, dismiss this morning, for this morning's worship. I'm glad that each and every one of you could be here once again and uh, to worship with us this morning, our Lord and Savior. If you have the opportunity to be back this evening at 530, we'll greatly uh, be pleased to have you with us as we worship together. I do have a few announcements. Um, I have a card from uh, the Ellis family that says that they would like to thank the church family for the prayers, the many prayers that they got. On behalf of their granddaughter, Journey, uh, who is, uh, continues to, to deal with chemo treatments, 
Also for uh, Loretha uh, Wallace and her diabetic, diabetic coma that she had, thank the Lord that she's, she's out of that now. And also for uh, Loretta, for uh, Loretta, excuse me, for her, uh, her battle with COVID that she has, that she's uh, has gotten over that. So we thank, thank the Lord for their continuous improvement. We need to add uh, Janie, Jeannie Lane to our announcements for a prayer list. Uh, Jeannie is having her sixth knee surgery on Monday the 25th, so I know that's a, that's a real, real, real big thing there. I don't have three myself, so I know how difficult it is to get over knee surgery, so this is her sixth knee surgery. So let's continue to pray for Jeannie Lane uh, throughout the week uh, as she's going on this surgery she's having. I, this morning, uh, following service, there was an Easter egg hunt. Uh, t this morning, everyone is asked to bring potluck. I guess they should be already here. Uh, and candy filled eggs. All ladies are invited to a baby shower honoring Alex and, and Grant Sturgis uh, this evening at 3.30 to 5 p.m. in the Downstairs Fellowship Hall. And they all registered at, at Amazon. Uh, last, the leaders practice today as well. Uh, we'll have puppets at 2.30 and sung leading uh, speech and Bible reading at 3.30 p.m. Uh, tonight's Teen Devo has been canceled, uh, and we'll let you know as soon as it is re, uh, rescheduled again. We will not have uh, women. We will not have women of the word and standing in the gap this week. Uh, that they will meet next. Uh, the next time they will meet will be April the, the April the eighth. Uh, just to make sure, this note right here: Wednesday night. This coming up Wednesday night, March the twenty seventh. Everyone will need to enter the, uh, through the downstairs fellowship hall. Uh, our air conditions and are being worked on all next week in the foyer and the auditorium will be closed. So all adult classes will be in the auditorium, excuse me, will be in the downstairs uh, fellowship hall uh, Wednesday night and the youth classes will be in the B wing. Mystery fellowship will be April the 5th at 630. Uh, if you plan to attend that, please get with Hannah or, or Derek on that event. All ladies are invited to a baby shower honoring uh, Shelby and Kyle on April the 7th at 3.30 p.m. to 5 p.m. in the Downstairs Fellowship Hall. Uh, that, that concludes our announcement. If you would please at this time stand for the closing song and closing prayer. We're going to close with number 708, 708. We'll sing the first and the last verse. Sing the one cross. Father, thank you for allowing us to come together today to be able to join together and worship and sing praises in your name. We just thank you for all the blessings that you've given us each and every day, the way you take care of us and look over us. We just pray that you'll be with those that are unable to be here, those that are sick and those that are locked in. We just pray that you'll be with them, help heal their bodies. Just be with us as we go out into the world. Help us be good examples of your word. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.